This conference will now be recorded. Um, if you do want to send an email to us, that'll um, notify the, the leadership group. And we do have a LinkedIn website, as well as Facebook and Discord. And we had a couple of folks coming from the meetup group. Did, did anyone here from the meetup group make it yet? So we do actually have a meetup. So uh, we were posting everything there. If you have any questions, or uh, I think we also have a um, distribution email group. So we can send out emails to everybody about upcoming events. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Rob. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. So welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Rob Sinclair. I'm actually from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And just a couple things about me. I'm not going to read through all these, but uh, I work for CEC, Civil and Environmental Consultants. Um, you know, we're one of our offices is here in Austin. We have about 50 employees. And I've been doing this type of work for 20 plus years. Um, I'm an FAA Part 107 remote pilot, also a Autodesk expert elite, similar to what Tom is, and Civil 3D and AutoCAD certified professional. And I go around to all of our offices and teach our 650 CAD users how to use the software on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, restrooms, are, if you need them, located out in the elevator lobby to the right. And those of you that are on the go to meeting, you're missing out on some good food. We got uh, some London broil and chicken. And, and the, that's one thing this office does is they eat really well. So um, what's that? Did you say, are we hiring? We actually are. Um, we, we have 100 open positions right now. So if anybody's interested, I got business cards up here. Send me your resume and we'll talk. But, Quick agenda, I, I got a lot to cover today, so I'm gonna touch kind of on the surface level of a bunch of different technologies. I'm willing to stick around after the presentation to talk more, more in depth if you're interested. And I'm also willing to come back later to present on a more specific topic if you guys will have me back and want that. So, um, so we're just gonna go through an intro. We're gonna watch a quick video, an overview of Volterra Italy and the project team. And then we're going to look at some drone, laser, laser scanning, photogrammetry technologies, AR, VR. And also for everybody that's online, um, everybody has a Google Cardboard VR headset in front of them. So later on in the presentation, we're actually going to do some hands-on demonstrations with some of the data that we captured over in Italy. And then we'll close it out and then open it up for questions. So, uh, so little couple slides on CEC. We do have 24 offices. I'm based out of our Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania office, which is our headquarters. Um, we have 1,100 employees, and we are an employee-owned company, so all the employees have the option to buy stock in the company. We do tons of different work. So everything you see on the left there, primarily in this office, we do solid waste, surveying, and also like civil engineering site development work. So primarily what we're going to focus on today is under the survey and geospatial technologies. And that's it for overview of CEC. So this is a great video um, that I wanted to show you to kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about. We actually had um, different news uh, people following us around the city whenever we were over in Italy. And this was from the International Business Times, and they did a great uh, great video which does a way better job than I, I can do to explain what this is all about. Apologize for the choppiness up there. What makes Montana particularly interesting, not only that we have 3,000 years of history, but we're actually a historical monument from each of its various phases, which is very rare, it's extremely rare. Uh, the Etruscan Gate, for example, is only one of two in Italy that is totally intact as it was originally built. So we're talking about a very important monument.
Laser scanning or LIDAR gives us very accurate measurements that we can use to very accurately recreate it digitally. Uh, so it gives us millions and millions of measurements along the surface of the irregular stone uh, stonework that you see behind me. And what that allows us to do is to create virtual models that very accurately represent these historical features. Um, we've been using photogrammetry to create uh, photorealistic textured surface models uh, of objects down to very small uh, archaeological and historical artifacts um, all the way up to entire city blocks using drones. A lot of the buildings here and the artifacts are ancient, uh, dating back thousands of years. Uh, and, uh, and that rich uh, tradition obviously can't be with us forever. Uh, over time, things deteriorate, uh, the potential for landslides. The city actually lost part of the medieval wall. Uh, so, you know, you're not assured that these treasures will be with us forever. Um, and also, you know, the, the documentation of the structures is, is not great, you know. Uh, so if there is a chance to have to rebuild some of the structures, we now have a virtual replica of what they look like today so they can be reconstructed more faithfully. Uh, the other part of it is that if we continue to scan the city occasionally over the time, you can do comparison scans and start to identify uh, things that may be deteriorating or maybe settling uh, and potentially fix the problem before something disastrous might happen. With the object capture that we're doing, we can actually create virtual exhibits. And this one really important aspect of the work we're doing here is the opportunity to create virtual exhibits that can bring these features and these objects to people who may not be able to visit the city in person. And so it's a way to create sort of an online gallery that shows people the historical significance and beauty of it. <laughs> for the choppiness there. Um, I think there's too many connections. But so live Volterra, um, you know, the mayor that you saw speaking there. Does anybody speak Italian by the way? I don't. And there's definitely a language barrier when we were over there. But Volterra, um, it's one of the oldest cities in Tuscany. And they actually offered to give a residential college to the University of Detroit University as long as they renovated it. So that's what you see on the screen there before renovation on the left half of that image and after. So they essentially gave this building that was built in the 1800s, which is the newest building in Tuscany. And they invested 750,000 euros to renovate this residential college. And that's kind of the base of where we did all this work out of. And they have, you know, artists come over there and they use it all year round. So that's kind of where we, we, uh, have all of our 
put our labs and everything set up. So the the gist of this whole thing started as a reality capture workshop back in 2016. And I actually got a call from Autodesk and one of our resellers to be a part of the team on the civil 3D and drone and laser scanning side of things. So it was half industry experts and half students that wanted to learn how to do all this stuff with all these technologies that we're gonna talk about. So it was a workshop, there was about 18 people there and we spent two weeks in Italy in 2016 and we went back in 2018 and we're planning on going back in April of this year, but with the coronavirus spreading in Europe, we may postpone that. So, so everything that I'm gonna talk about, you all have the opportunity to be a part of this team. Um, and there's gonna be a link at the end to get more information on that. So the, the team, um, Autodesk is a big partner. Case Technologies is an Autodesk reseller, but Leica, Lenovo, Euclidion, 3DR, Faro, they all donated equipment to this, this process. So everything that we had, software and hardware, was all donated to this project. We had to give it back at the end though, so we didn't get to keep it. So Volterra is in central Italy, it's halfway between uh, Florence and Pisa. So it's in Tuscany, the heart of Tuscany, and it sits up on top of a mountain. You know, it's beautiful countryside. Um, most of the city was built between the 13 and 1500s. And one of the things that Volterra is famous for, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this Twilight series, The New Moon. Um, if not, maybe your wives have seen it. But um, So the funny thing is, I guess in the movie and the books, like the, the vault tree would come out of this manhole. And so tourists would flock to this manhole and obviously they'd write messages on here, they'll lay down and they'll kiss the manhole and you know do all kinds of weird things to take pictures. But the funny thing is it's down this deep dark alley and that's where all the locals go at 2 a.m. to believe themselves after they get whipped out of the bar. So, <laughs> Another movie. <laughs> Another movie, the first Netflix series that was filmed there is Medici. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that, but actually our data set, um, one of the projects we're gonna look at the Etruscan Arch was damaged by the movie set. And we had a pre-laser scan and a post-laser scan to show that they actually damaged this arch. So, you know, it's pretty, pretty good stuff. So the gist of this, uh, the mayor actually invited us to do this digital preservation in Volterra for numerous reasons. Um, a lot of earthquakes over there, natural disasters, you know, if, and, and he wanted to digitally capture all of the, the precious history in his city in case something would happen, we could recreate it exactly how it was today. So there was a landslide on the wall there back in um, 20, 13, I think, 2014. Uh, so there's been a, a variety of landslides and different things throughout uh, throughout Volterra. And ironically, uh, the Notre Dame uh, fire happened when we were on our flight home after the last trip. And the mayor of Volterra actually tweeted and thanked us for what we were doing because if something like that would happen in his city, we now have all this digitally captured to rebuild it. Just like the Notre Dame Cathedral was laser scanned for um, the video game industry, uh, Assassin's Creed actually. So they were able to take that data and they're gonna use it to rebuild Notre Dame. So um, another use of this data is documentation. So we actually had an architect, um, you, you guys here. All right, um, so an architect took this data and created documentation of one of the Roman theaters, which we're going to talk about a little bit more. And we also did three different, three different Roman theater sites. So we scanned one in Volterra, and then um, the UBO Roman theater, and also the this old Roman theater. And ironically, there's been books written about Roman theaters and how they're laid out. And the, the study this guy did 
actually proved all the old research wrong because he actually had the point cloud data to compare and, and basically figure out how the Roman theaters are actually based on a seven-sided uh, polygon. So the information was then used for presentation purposes. Um, we actually 3D printed different things. We put things into VR. We actually had a holographic table from Euclidion. And that holographic table is $90,000, but you could get a similar experience with a $400 VR headset. So the technology is really cool, but you know, you got to judge, is it really worth spending $90,000? Um, the mayor of Voltaire that you saw in the video in the upper left there, and also in the lower picture, he had a welcoming ceremony for us when we first went over there. Um, and we really felt like uh, celebrities walking around the city, people were offering to buy us coffee, and you know, they just really appreciated us being over there and doing this type of work. Um, they also had a community meeting at the end where the entire city was invited to see the data that we captured. And uh, I love telling this little story about this, this little boy, six years old, that came in. He's navigating through Autodesk Recap through the point cloud better than any one of us can do. Um, and I wanted to hire the kid, but I guess, you know, he probably plays a lot of video games and understands how it all works. So it was, it was pretty awesome. Like I mentioned, we had a lot of press following us around. Uh, if you Google this project, there was 30 different articles written. Uh, one, of, one of the recent one in American Surveyor, which you all can take that article with you. Um, you know, it's a four, four or five page article that we, we have written. Uh, but there's all kinds of other articles out there that you're more than welcome to look up or get these links to uh, read more about this project. Uh, we also won uh, AIA Award for Innovation in 2017 and also People's Choice Award for all the work we did over there. So we're going to talk more about this now. So 2016, Arrow donated one Arrow X330. We had a 3DR Solo drone with a GoPro on it, and we had our smartphones. That's all the equipment we had in 2016, and we captured a lot of good data. Now, fast forward to 2018, 2019, Leica donated uh, two BLK 360s, two RTC 360s. We had uh, Leica GPS survey equipment. We had the Pegasus backpack, which is a $250,000 piece of equipment. We had a fleet of drones. We also had Faro laser scanners. So all of these companies saw the work we did in 2016 and all wanted to donate the equipment to have their name be a part of this project. So we had all kinds of resources um, behind us the last trip. So the goal is to kind of document the entire city. And you can see the areas um, that we already captured like the pink areas are outdoor spaces that we captured. Uh, the red are indoor spaces that we captured. And then the blue is what we're planning on capturing this year. But we're actually uh, planning to fly this with um, a LIDAR drone this year, as long as we, we get to go over there to capture the entire city. One, one problem though is right here on the left side is a, uh, a prison. So you're not allowed to fly drones over a prison. Uh, we probably could get special permission to do that, but we're still kind of working out the kinks uh, for, for that part. So just um, I want to start by just laying the groundwork on a few terminologies, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, reality capture is capturing the world around you using photogrammetry or laser scanning. So all kinds of sensors that we have, you know, including our cell phones, can be used to capture reality. It could be drones, it could be handheld laser scanners, um, your smartphone, like I mentioned, 360 cameras, or, or even a GoPro. Uh, anybody in the room have drones or buy drones for their company? No? Personal ones? Okay. What about laser scanning? Anybody do laser scanning? 
So photogrammetry, it could be with or without a drone, is using basically photos that overlap each other and create a 3D model or a mesh model. You know, we use this most in civil engineering to create topography. Um, and then we use that in civil 3D to kind of grade to or use to design our site. LIDAR stands for Light Image Detection and Ranging. So LIDAR is similar to sonar, but it uses a laser. So this could be on a drone, could be terrestrial LIDAR, and it just bounces laser beams off of surfaces and gets measurements. Another thing we're going to talk about is augmented reality. So AR is what we like to refer to it as, is overlaying the world around you through, through a device. So it could be your cell phone, an iPad. Um, you know, think about the Pokemon Go game that was a big hit a year or two ago. Um, you know, you can look at underground infrastructure through an iPad. Uh, you can even snap or augment 3D models to a site plan. You know, if I have a site plan on this table, I can snap a 3D site 3D model to that and walk around with an iPad or just spin that plan around and the 3D model will follow that. Virtual reality, um, you know, you can use like an Oculus Rift, Samsung Gear, Google Cardboard, which we're going to talk about and show you some examples later on, um, is getting immersed in the technology. So you actually put a headset on and you're actually in the site. Um, Mixed reality is used for construction primarily, where you can use the Microsoft HoloLens and you see a combination of the AR and VR. So that's considered mixed reality. And then reality computing, which we're going to talk about a lot of these different softwares, you know, you capture the data and then you compute the data and then create something, you know, whether it's a Simple 3D surface model or a Revit model, um, you know, even Maps works. So we'll create that. And then you could take that data into virtual reality. And you can also compare that data over time to see if there's any changes. So uh, with, with the drones that, um, you know, in the States here and what we use in Italy, um, you know, you, the drone that you fly with the Part 107 license has to be under 55 pounds. So some people refer to it as SUAS or SUAV. So small unmanned aircraft system or small unmanned aircraft vehicle. The, the vehicle is just the drone itself. The system is the drone and the sensor that you have on it. So it could be a, a camera or a laser scanner. And those come in all different uh, shapes and sizes. Um, we here at CEC, we actually have um, 30 different drones in our fleet. Our, our COO actually calls it our Air Force. Um, so we have probably one of our, our biggest one, our workhorse is that EB on the left, it's a fixed wing, and it can capture a lot of ground in a, a short amount of time. And one of the biggest reasons we use drones is safety, you know, you're not putting people at risk by climbing, you know, towers or stockpiles, you know, with a drone, it's much safer. And you could capture so much more data much quicker than a, a surveyor on a stockpile. You know, you could fly that stockpile in five minutes and capture millions of points of data where he could be out there all day and only capture a few hundred points. The accuracy of the drone data is, is really, really good too. And I have some examples of that in this presentation I'm going to show you. But, you know, with the high resolution cameras upwards of 50 megapixel, uh, you could get accuracies within one inch. And some drones now, like that EV I mentioned, has uh, RTK built in, which is uh, real time kinematic. It's um, basically a survey grade GPS. And that sensor, when we bought that, it actually added $30,000 to the price of that drone. It's come down a lot since, but it makes it so much more accurate when you have that survey grade GPS. It's a lot different than like a Phantom 4, 
that has like a cell phone grade GPS in it. It's still relatively accurate, but um, you know, with that RTK system, it, it's a lot, a lot better. But one thing we always do uh, is we always set ground control points when we capture data and we survey those ground control points in so that we are sure that our data is accurate and it's tied into a state plan coordinate system. Um, a few different ways we do that. Uh, we have final targets, we have painted targets, and one of the technologies that we really love using are these arrow points. Uh, they're solar powered GPS targets that we throw down. They triangulate between themselves and you can actually submit them and get an opus solution or a corrected solution. Uh, but one thing that we do, we always shoot them in conventionally just to back check it to make sure it's correct. Uh, a couple tips on ground control points. Whenever you lay these out, um, you wanna have basically five ground control points in each flight. So every takeoff and landing, you wanna have five ground control points. And then we also do at least 20 check shots so that we can verify that the data is correct. Because sometimes in between the ground control points, your data could get warped and we wanna just check to make sure it's, it's nailed down. Think of, a, think of a tarp that you would stake with you know, five, five stakes and if the wind would catch it in between the stakes, the tarp could blow up in the air a little bit. So the same thing can happen with your data. So that's why we want to have all these checks in place to make sure it's accurate. Comment online. Yeah. Um, a couple regulations, uh, Italy versus the United States. So ironically, the first time we went to Italy in 2016, we had to hire an Italian remote pilot and have an Italian registered drone. And that's, that's why we got stuck using that 3DR with the GoPro. We, we have our own equipment, but we weren't permitted to use it because of the Italian uh, regulations. Fast forward to 2018, 2019, we, we are allowed to use our own equipment. Now they loosen the regulations, but there's a few differences between the US and Italy now. Um, you know, you can only fly 230 feet above ground level in the Italy, but you could fly up to 400 feet in the US. Uh, you know, in the US, you have to keep your drone within line of sight, visual line of sight, um, and you can't use any binoculars or anything to, to look at the drone. It has to be with your naked eye. Um, in Italy, you can only fly 525 feet away from your position. Uh, you also have to, in the States, five miles within an airport, you have to get uh, lance clearance. Uh, in Italy, you have to stay three miles outside of an airport. And in the States here, you have to have a part 107 FAA license. Uh, in Italy, you just need a proof of insurance. So you do have to register your drone in the States here, even if you're using it for recreational purposes, you have to get that registered. And they'll actually give you an end number, just like manned aircraft have, in case something does happen, they could track that drone back to you as an individual. <clears throat> so one of the primary uses for drones is capturing photogrammetry, whether it's uh, a nadir photo, which is straight down to capture topography, or more oblique photos to capture a 3D model. And we're going to look at examples of both of those. Uh, there's a couple of the projects that we worked on there mixed in with a few other photos, but you see the topography in the lower right corner there. That's primarily what we use drones for. And the workflow to capture that data um, goes a little bit like this. So you do your flight planning. So you wanna map out your flight plan and then you wanna do the actual data collection and then you do the post-processing in software. So whenever you pre, uh, do the flight planning in the drone, um, we call this mowing the grass. You know, it just goes back and forth and every one of those red dots is a photo. Then you use photogrammetry to stitch it all together to create a 3D model. And you could get an 
a regular ortho photo, super high resolution. Um, you could, at times, you could zoom in and read, you know, letters on the manhole cover. That's how good this imagery is. And then create uh, topography from that for use in Civil 3D. So again, just the workflow, we set the ground control points, fly the site what, using photogrammetry or LIDAR. One of the main softwares that we prefer using is PIX4D. And then we go from PIX4D into Autodesk Recap Pro, because now since 2017, Civil 3D can no longer input an LAS file. You're forced to take that LAS file into Recap bring it into Civil 3D. So one of the projects um, is this Etruscan arch that we worked on, and this is 3,000 years old, and one of the oldest Etruscan arches in all of Italy. And the mayor, there's a newer Etruscan arch that's on the UNESCO World Heritage Certification List, and the mayor really wants this one to be on that list. And this is what got damaged in the Medici series. They actually hung wood doors from this arch and damaged it. So we were able to compare laser scan data pre and post and show them actually, you know, what they did. <clears throat> so this model here, this was one captured in 2016 using that GoPro camera. And this is only 10% of the data. So if I open this model up in the software, and showed you this. I mean, it's it's spectacular for just the GoPro. You know, the sign there. If you could read Italian, um, you could make out what that sign says, and just see the detail of the, the 3D model just from photogrammetry. So the way we captured that is, you know, using overlapping images. So you can do this with your iPhone. You know, I can capture a, a soda can or any anything out in the, the real, real world by just taking equidistant photos away from an object and having overlap. So I could take 24 images around a, a plane and then maybe come up at a 15 degree angle and take 24 more images and then process that in different softwares to create something like this. So this was captured just with an iPhone. And you can see the detail in the grass. Um, so there's a few different models in here that were all captured with just an iPhone. And then this information could be pulled into all of the softwares that we use. You know, you pull it into Infoworks or Recap and then bring it into Civil 3D for different uses. Reddit's a big one too. Any architects in here? A couple, nice. We've got some Reddit stuff in here. And then we uh, can also take all of that information and send it to a 3D printer to, to print it. And that's one of the things that the mayor wanted. You know, they have all this um, history over there that people come over to see and they can't really touch it because it's so valuable and so ancient. So we captured it using these technologies and then 3D printed it so that people can actually hold the object. If they break it, we just print another one. So there's another example of 3D printed object. As far as software goes, um, I mentioned PIX4D, I mentioned Recap. A few other desktop solutions to capture this data is Bentley Context Capture, Agisoft PhotoScan, there's cloud-based solutions, 3DR site scan, drone deploy, and propeller. Uh, we tested all the ones on the list here, but found that PIX4D gave us the best result. I mentioned the ground control as well. You want to check your ground control points. Uh, the, the theoretical error, which is your relative accuracy, and your error to your ground control initial position, which is your absolute accuracy. And that, um, in the world of photogrammetry, 
ground sampling distance is the key to how accurate that model really is. So the GST is very important and your maximum error is gonna be three times your GSD. So in this case, it's 0.65 inches. So it would be three times that in, in the worst case scenario. The GSD is calculated by, it, it's, it's really a, a kind of a tricky equation, but it's based on the focal length of the camera, your AGL above ground elevation, your overlap of your images, so there's a lot that goes into it, but once you process the data in PIX4D, you'll get a GSD value. Uh, the other thing it, that's tricky is point cloud classification. So as civil engineers, we just want the ground typically, but a lot of times you have cars, people, trees, everything on top of the surface that we want to get rid of. PIX4D, as well as Infoworks and other softwares have an automatic point cloud classification, but it gets you probably 95% of the way there. And once we export that data from PIX4D, we'll then process it through recap. Um, I'm sure everybody's used recap at one point, right? So when you open recap, you have three options. You can import to point cloud, um, you could transfer it from a mobile device so that's used if you're using the BLK 360 scanner. And then there's also the option in uh, recap to do a, a 3D uh, photo to 3D. So you can use your iPhone, capture something, and then upload it to uh, recap. A couple of tips with recap, like um, some trial and errors that we've been through. Um, you know, typically you want to assign your coordinate system twice in recap and then specify the proper units. And the biggest challenge that we've seen is the difference between US survey foot and international foot. So if you're not familiar with that, I would, I would try to read up on that because it's a big deal in our industries, the difference between survey foot and international foot. And then when we pop over to Civil 3D, you know, always start with a template. I always tell our guys, and then always assign a coordinate system before you bring data in. You can attach the point cloud. I'm sure everybody knows this, but you can pull this in under the extract manager. You can attach the point cloud file through there. And once you attach that, you can then create the surface to select that point cloud on the ribbon, hit create surface from point cloud. Name your surface, set the style. And this particular project is 12.9 million points. So you're thinking, do I really need all those points? So you can filter those out if you want to, but Civil 3D will handle this many points. I've actually processed in recap two trillion points before. That's trillion with a T, um, which is pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, that the software can handle that. Now there's three options once you get to this dialog box. You get to planar average, Kriging interpolation, or no filter. I always recommend using no filter because you Civil 3D does not really do a good job of filter, filtering points. You want to use other softwares to do that and then just use uh, recap Civil 3D workflow to bring the data <laughs> in unfiltered. And then you'll get this message in the lower right corner. It could take some time to process. You know, that could take a minute, it could take 30 minutes, depending on how big that point cloud data is. So with all that said, we, we did this on a, a project. It's a Roman amphitheater. And this was the first Roman amphitheater that was discovered in the world in the last 150 years. So we used uh, technologies like ground penetrating radar over there to identify that there was something under the ground. And right now there's archaeologists over there uncovering this. And we scanned this when it was just a field. We did a scan again whenever they started uncovering this. And then we'll do another scan whenever it's totally unearthed. So 
150 year old uh, Roman amphitheater, which is a pretty big finding um, that, that just occurred, you know, within the last six months. Uh, so this is really interesting. So this is the, the drone data and the terrestrial laser scan data combined in simple 3D. And this is a section between the two. So we use the RTC 360 and just the DJI Phantom 4 Pro. And you can see like here in this area, that's where it, the open field was. Over here, it started getting vegetated. Lasers will actually go through the vegetation where photogrammetry may not. Um, but then if you look at the tolerances between the two, you're uh, 300s there, 500s there, and 800s there, which is all within uh, tolerance. Um, so what we found by doing this data comparison is, you know, it, it really, I got more trust in that Phantom 4 drone by doing this than I had prior. I knew it was good, but like it, it's, it's a lot better than I expected. So we actually had survey GPS ground control points on the, on the ground compared to the laser scan data compared to the drone data. So pretty good results. So talking about uh, a little bit of LIDAR data now. So LIDAR and photogrammetry both use or both output a point cloud. I know the common misconception in our industry is just because you see a point cloud Everybody thinks it came from LIDAR, but that's not always the case. It could come from photogrammetry. Uh, terrestrial LIDAR can capture 1 million points a second. There's actually scanners that can capture 2 million points a second now. So you can set up a scan station, two, 2 to 10 minutes per scan, and you're going to get millimeter accuracy on each scan. So that picture in the lower left window is actually a point cloud. It's not a photo. And this, this is a like a P20 scanner that we have. Um, a scanner by itself, when it shoots the lasers out, it will return intensity values based on the absorption of whatever material it's reflecting off of. But if you combine that, and every scanner has this capability, you can add the photos on top of that, and it will superimpose the RGB value of that laser or that picture into every single point on the point cloud and create, you know, a, a kind of realistic, uh, fully colorized point cloud. And you can also look at the intensity values of that data. Then you could take that 3D model and create, um, you know, take it into BIM, uh, whether it's Revit, Plan 3D, Civil 3D, whatever it may be. And the big thing when you're dealing with uh, with them or SIM is the level of development. So you could do LOD 100 through 500, and LOD 100 is a lot easier than LOD 500. So wherever you get to like the 300 plus level, that's when you're starting to model the nuts and bolts and fittings of whatever you're scanning. That takes a lot more time. So LOD is a, a pretty big uh, pretty big deal when you're dealing with scanning. So mobile LiDAR, um, we have um, a Regal mobile LiDAR system that you could drive, drive down the street and pick up, you know, the paint striking on the road, utility lines, and you can extract all that to create a CAD deliverable. Here's a quick video of our UAV LIDAR. Uh, so we had two drones in the air and was recording one. So it's the same thing with photogrammetry. It kind of mows the grass, goes back and forth, but it captures it with a laser scanner, which the main difference between the two, photogrammetry, like I mentioned, does not penetrate the tree cover, but LIDAR will. So you can see how all these points return the ground surface, and we can extract everything above the ground and then have just a true ground surface to do our design against. And here's a, a paint up point cloud converted into a surface. And how that works, um, you have to register those point clouds together 
using target paste where you have either like a ground control checkerboard spheres or you can do cloud to cloud registration here's a quick video on this is actually that roman amphitheater site this was a challenge because it was a field and you know as you can imagine when the wind blows the grass and the trees aren't in the same place anymore so trying to do a cloud to cloud registration with objects that are moving it's kind of organic so this was kind of challenging to get it super accurate because things were in different spots in each scan but we got it to work um and it, it worked out really well so each scan is linked together <clears throat> And this is the laser scan data that we compared with the uh, photogrammetry data. In Navisworks, you could take those point clouds and here's the, the field before it was uncovered. And then you could turn that off and show the second laser scan that we did six months after. And you can show the comparison between those point clouds. So you could do like a historical comparison of your projects time time over time. Some of the softwares that we uh, use to classify the ground data are, are listed there. Um, you know, Infoworks is one of them that you all know. Uh, Global Mapper is another one. We also use 3D Reshaper, which is now Cyclone 3DR, but that does not do a classification that does, it creates some triangulated mesh just by using uh, an algorithm or angles to extract the ground surface. Um, this, this tool is great, but it doesn't always give you good results. Um, sometimes it gets rid of good data. And then you can create the topography um, in uh, Cyclone 3DR. Probably one of the best classification softwares we found is TerraSolid. But the unfortunate thing, I know everybody in here is an Autodesk guy, this runs on MicroStation. So if you ever, if you're used to Autodesk and you gotta go to MicroStation, it's, it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> uh, for the architects, talk about a few more projects here. So this was uh, the Plaza de Puri, the town hall was built in 1208, the oldest civic building in Tuscany. But inside was uh, spectacular. Um, just all these frescoes on the wall. And we, we scanned this using the, um, the ferro scanners. And then we actually converted um, this point cloud data. And these are all point clouds, these aren't photos. So the points are so close together, it almost looks like a photo. Converted this um, then into a 3D mesh. And then that 3D mesh could be brought into Revit Interworks, Navisworks, other softwares. We also um, put this into Revit. So these are the point clouds that we then converted and created a Revit model and took that into uh, VR. The Roman theater site. So this, this is a different project than the Roman amphitheater. There is a difference between the Roman theater and the Roman amphitheater. But this was built in the first century BC, and we scanned this entire project. We had to do 140 setups to capture all the data because when the scanner, you know, if I'm standing here and I'm trying to scan on the other side of that table, it's called shadows. So it's not going to get under the table. So you have to uh, strategically place the scans to pick up all those shadows around whatever object you're picking up. So this is the data that that architect used to do all his research. Um, and that's actually me down there scanning. Um, that's the point cloud data on the left there. This is actually a video of that entire Roman theater point cloud in Autodesk Recap. And this is un uncleaned. So you will see some like uh, some noise or artifacts in there. You see some people in the scene there. Some, you know, we we'll go through and clean all that noise out of the scan. Mm -hmm. 
the, uh, the baptistry was also built um, in the 13th century. Um, and this is one of the projects that we actually took into Revit, put the point cloud in the Revit, created a Revit model from this. I'm gonna go to the next slide here so you can see the Revit model. One of the, the cool things we, we found out by analyzing this data, this was built in the 1300s, but the, the, this roof here, you know, you get eight different sections that come to a point, and the tolerance was within an eighth of an inch built in the 1300s, which is just incredible. So I do have a, a giveaway for, for you guys, and let me flip the slide here. So just, we're talking about technology. So anybody see the Living Wine Label app? I'll show a video of it real quick here. So using the Living Wine Label app, you can make these labels come alive. Easter Monday, 1876. He made bread for the ship to He nearly sunk getting there. But after two days, hands, bloody, and growing. So it's essentially a QR code. And we're going to use QR codes to open up data to put in these VR headsets here in a minute. Um, but I'll give this away. So the question, I want everybody to raise their hand and, and take a guess of what this is. But one of the projects we did is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So if you have a guess of what the angle of lean is, raise your hand. And whoever gets within the closest tenth of a degree will get this. Uh, anybody? Start guessing. Go ahead. Nope. Nope. Lower. Nope. Nope. Higher. Oh. Higher. Lower. Four percent. Yep. You got it. How'd you know that? Did you Google it? No. Pass it down. I waited for everybody else to narrow it down. No, it's good. So yeah, it's. It feels like more than that. Yeah, so I thought wine and Italy kind of go together. So it is around 4%. Um, so we actually scan the Leaning Tower of Pisa. We were actually doing another project near Pisa, and we're like, let's go scan it. But we got 95% of the scans done before the Italian military shut us down and told us we couldn't scan anymore. So we still got awesome data from this project. <laughs> we didn't get arrested. We just told them it was a camera. So there's a language barrier. We're just going like this and it was a camera and they're like, no, and they had machine guns and everything. So we're like, all right, we're done. Um, no drones now. So there's QR codes in this presentation. Um, there's also QR codes in, on that card in front of you. So uh, one of the projects is that uh, uh, Revit model that's in the Plaza de Fury. So that's actually hosted on an Autodesk uh, web, web service. And there's a video of that space. So you can look at it on your computer like this, or if you open it on your phone, you can enter VR mode and actually get into the uh, project. We did uh, the QR code on that card will actually take you to 12 different projects that we did. And to use that, if you have an iPhone, you just use your camera app, hover over the QR code. There will be a pop up at the top. Just click on that, and then you can open up any one of those projects that are on there. So, and I can put it on the screen here. So I get a link at the top. This project is the Chelsea Day San Francisco, which is actually a church in Tuscany. And inside this church, it's pretty incredible. Um, so if you, if you want to scan that QR code and open it, feel free. You can do it later, too. No big deal. You, uh, you'll have, and this is actually hosted in Matterport, all different Matterport projects. And you can actually, once you open that, you can just hover, just focus one of those blue dots and we'll take you to kind of the next scan location. Yep, yep, and you guys do that on, on your own later on if you want. Another cool thing, augmented reality, this is a relatively new software called Torch. So Torch, you can take these 3D models and place them in Torch and then kind of scan your space. So I can scan this table right now and drop a model in this room 
and then we can walk around that or navigate in through the model just by using our phone. So this is me just at a table in a restaurant, you know, just dropping the model on there, recording my phone screen as I go through. Um, so you can do this outside too. So if you if you have an entire project site in say InfraWorks that you wanted to load on an iPad and take your client out in the field and show him like what his project's going to look like out in the field through an iPad, you can do that. Is that similar to the HoloLens? Um, it, it's a little bit different. I mean, uh, the torch will use a phone or iPad. The HoloLens is glasses, you know, that you would look through. Um, it can if you tie it into coordinates, yes. Um, yeah. So, right, right. So the, another big challenge is storing and sharing all this data, because as, as you imagine, millions and millions of points of data, sometimes these data sets are two terabytes, which is a lot. Our, our IT guys want to murder us every time we put one of these projects on the server just because of the server cost. So our workflow is to put them on solid state hard drive. So we just store it on there. We make a backup copy that we store off site in the state, just in case. And then if we have to give it to our client, we'll either give them a, a solid state hard drive, or we kind of custom develop the SharePoint site that we call CEC Go that has unlimited, unlimited cloud storage, and we'll upload it to there. Um, another new technology that just came out like six months ago is this Sintu platform, which is incredible because you can actually, um, let me pull up the website here. Let me drop it on the screen. So this is the full point cloud data hosted in a web, web service. And you can just send this link to your client and he could get all the scan data, take measurements, look at all the scan positions. There's actually, when you open this, if you had an Oculus Rift connected to your computer, the VR button will show up here and you can experience this site in the Oculus Rift. Um, so this is a really uh, great product. I think it's, you know, it's a game changer for the industry. for what we do is because it, it, and it works super efficiently in the, in the web browser. Here's a, we got a few minutes. Yeah. We had a filmmaker following us and he created this video. Historically significant to the entire world, both here in Italy, and uh, we are working together with a team of professionals from all across the world. In eight different countries are represented here, and the people are just tremendous. <laughs> This is Mark D. Stewart, Director of Services with Peace Technologies from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. As we're here with a team of professionals from all over the world, uh, capturing important historical and archaeological sites. Workshop is a great opportunity to learn about the latest technologies and reality capture. We have access to some uh, wonderful tools and equipment and the expertise of dozens of individuals that come from all over the world to participate. that's remarkable about the workshop for me is that every year we continue to uh, identify and digitize new sites around the city. And now this year with the digitization of the Roman amphitheater, so rewarding to be a part of a team that continues to provide value and continues to enhance the collaboration with the stakeholders here in the city. I 
video that this filmmaker put together for us um, turned out awesome. So that's it. Um, leave you with the sunset over Tuscany and open it up for questions. Um, I know a little over time, we, we started a little bit late too, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to. I've seen um, recently interviews, live arts, do researching. Do you think that's something? We, we've talked about that. Yeah, it, it's tough because it's tough to identify the actual tree species from the data. So you really need somebody that, that is a professional with that to identify the species. You can definitely use LIDAR to identify the caliper or size of the tree. And we've, we've done that where, you know, some depends on the area, you have to take the measurement so far off the ground. So you could take that point cloud, flip the data, say four or six feet above the ground, and then identify the size of the tree. But the species is a whole different story. Yeah. Somebody have a question over here? Yeah. So uh, we are not occupants here. So I see that you know you feel like first time interview. So I was so crazy. Is this like a process mostly for high cost things like castles, very important buildings, or can we take advantage for low budget? Projects like there's a building and you need to measure. So, as that, this is really expensive, and you know, the budget is always minimal. Can we take advantage of this, or it's not worth Yeah, so it, it's like laser scanning, like entry level, the BLK 360 is about $16,000, or you could spend $150,000 on a laser scanner. So the accuracy isn't as good with the $16,000 one, but it depends on what your tolerance level is and what you want to capture. Another technology that's really, really good is um, the Matterport camera. If you look that up, it's about a $3,000 technology that uses photogrammetry to capture interior spaces. And you'll get um, measurements within maybe a quarter to a half of an inch, where laser scanning is going to get you probably within an eighth or a sixteenth inch. 
So it all depends on what your final outcome of your project is. You could also rent laser scanners. Lots of companies around that do that. So, yeah. Kind of um, background degree or like certifications do you have to get from students? There is nothing that exists right now. So I, I would say none. Uh, like as far as I know on the laser scanning side, there's no certifications. We actually have trouble finding people that have this special specialization because there's no schools that teach it. On the photogrammetry side of things, you could become a certified photogrammetrist, but that's more for, I think it's still more for the old school aerial surveys that we had done 50 years ago, but you could do it now in the digital era, but it really isn't certifications on this end of things. Does your background civil or surveying? Um, my background is civil primarily, um, and I'm, I just enjoy technology and want to learn new things all the time. So I just kind of grabbed hold of all this technology and, and learned about it. So, yes? Your post processing time compared to the other one around the world, you know, you get yeah. like 2 million points versus you get a few number of what? That's a good question. Yeah. So it, if you if you guys have civil 3D set up like we do, where you do field to finish, you know you can process a survey in a few minutes. That's where the challenge of this data comes in is post processing. You need somebody that's well versed in to manage this data set and clean the point cloud, align and register the point cloud. Um, so you could capture a lot of information in less time, but then you're going to be spending a little more time in the office to manage all this data and and create whatever your deliverable is. Everybody else's IT budgets, the computer can handle those type of point clouds. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. So in, in today's computer era, if you want to call it that, any new computer can handle this stuff. It just might take it longer than a more expensive computer. We have a dedicated machine um, that costs us about $10,000. We'll, we'll just remote into it, start crunching the data and just let it run. Like a photogrammetry project, it might take five or six hours just to crunch the data, but you don't have to interact with it when it's doing that. So we have a dedicated box just to log in, let it do its thing, and we'll log back in five or six hours later to get the data set. Yeah. So in terms of your question about the certifications, uh, ACP offered a class uh, a couple of semesters ago where they did a class where we actually went out in the field and did like with the pixelated aircraft, uh, and then in the following week we did the processing that whole cloud that's captured. Okay. I don't know if they're still offering it or not, but um, we have to do the EIS program. The EIS program. The one I did was just kind of a continuing education course, so it wasn't just you know the full thing. It was just show up on a Saturday. You know, we're going to spend four hours together and do this thing and show up next time. It wasn't even, you know, so much more. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, a couple comments online there. Uh, Pix4D, best overall software. That ACC course has also been offered as a three, one day each continuing ed education course. Um, what coordinate system did we use for Italy? Um, I'll have to look it up, but it's an Italian specific uh, coordinate system similar to our state plane system. I'll, I'll get the exact code of it. But. So um, here's some more information that you could take with you. Um, if you have any questions, my email address there. You could also look me up on LinkedIn. I have business cards up here if you want to take one of those. Um, we have a microsite dedicated to this project. So cecinc.com slash Italy. A lot more photos and models and interactive things you can do. And the University of Detroit, um, Voltaire Detroit Foundation link is there, which you can actually get information about the upcoming reality capture workshop if you want to be a part of it. So, any other questions? Yeah, that's any yet. Please do so. And feel free to take take that stuff with you if you like. If not, you can leave it behind. But thank you everyone for, for coming. Appreciate it.
Thank you, Rob. You're welcome. Mm -hmm.